mirrors. This is a good little thing. And what we have here is a 1986 Toyota Cressida 2.8 liter engine, A42 DL transaxle, 96,549 miles. It has a warm idle misfire, but it runs okay when it's cold. All right, so what does that typically mean when you've got one that's got a warm idle misfire, but whenever you get above idle and you're driving it, it seems to smooth out? Plugs. Plugs? Excuse me? Wires. Wires? Okay, you guys just okay. I guess you're in the dark now. Yeah, there's a clue to the nature of the problem in that the car ran smooth when the engine was cool, but developed a consistent idle misfire at operating temperature. What to do first, okay? When a vehicle idles rough with high fuel trim numbers but normalizes at road speed, we're talking about a vacuum leak. Right? Correct? Yes. Isn't that right? Why does a vacuum leak not affect the engine as much when you're driving as it does when you're idling? Because, it's because there's a lot of more, there's a lot more volume going in there and the, and the small leak doesn't make that much difference. It's like a smaller amount of the total. That's how that goes. And this is engine performance thing. And this is kind of like vacuum leaks, like you see a little split hose, a little broke hose. And there's a, you know, injector rings, you know, all kinds of stuff like that can be vacuum leak. Well, since 1986 predated OBD2 systems by almost a decade, the first OBD2 systems I saw was in 1994 on the Thunderbird. Now, some of the other. Now, Chevrolet did this thing in 1995 on Camaros where they had an OBD2 connector, but it was still OBD1. Boy, that'll confuse you if you don't know that's what's going on, right? All right. So anyway, there's no misfire monitor. Codes wouldn't be much of a help on this one. When there's no misfire monitor, what do they use the cam sensor for? Timing of what? Injectors. The timing of the injector. That's what they use it for. All right, now look around right here. These are the codes available on the 1986 Cressida. 15 codes in all. That's all the codes you had. Furthermore, you had to watch the light flash. On some of these Asian cars, you had to reach up under the seat, and there's a little, the engine controller was under the seat, and it had some little lights in there, and you had to turn a little screw to the self-test position and count the flashes on the green light. With all due respect, I thought that was kind of dumb. You know what I mean? Why don't we just have this thing do it work a different way? Anyway, the simple fact is, 1, 2, 12, 13, see how the codes would flash out? They're basically giving the pattern of 31, 32. You can see how they work. And you had to jump for these two correctors, T1 and that one. And whenever you jump for those connectors, you had it in self-test. Now, on some of them, you would, if like on some of the ones, there's different things you have to do on some vehicles. On some of the Chryslers, when you were setting the timing, you'd have to unplug the engine coolant temperature sensor instead of the spout connector like you do on a Ford and all that. But anyway, you jump this. Now, the old-fashioned power balance test is a good way to determine which cylinder is misfiring if PCMs, Ford, PO3, XX code aren't available or if they're not helping. How many of you guys have had a, a situation where you were trying to find a misfire on a vehicle and uh, the darn thing did not throw you a code for a misfire. That's annoying. You're hoping your scan tool will point you right to the cylinder. I want to see a PO304 so I can go right to cylinder number four. It doesn't always happen that way, particularly if you're driving up a hill and it goes bite, 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 bite. That's not enough to throw a misfire code, right? And uh, so, that if you've got IDS and you've got power balance, you're in Fat City, because it'll, it'll catch that. And that's why the Ford engineers put that together, or the service engineer would. Now, while the more seasoned technicians pull the spark plug wires for years with the risk of experiencing a volt jolt, <laughs> that's kind of funny. I saw Donnie reaching over there on one of those little escorts that had a multi-strike. At idle, it would fire three times every time it popped, like on the Crown Vic and the little escort we got out here. They've been doing that for a long time, ever since, you know, like 91. Anyway, he reaches over here, and he goes, I think the problem is over here. And all of a sudden, that thing got him. Bow! Like it got you the other day, you know? And he, he rammed his fender, his, you know, just reflex. He hits the fender with his knee. He raises up. He hits his head on the hood. He <laughs> staggers back, and he says, oh, my goodness. And that fender was bent. He goes, did, did I do that with my knee? <laughs> I don't know if he did or not, but, boy, it was. I heard it pop, and it just shook him up, man. But anyway, this right here is not really a good way to do it. If you are going to try to do it that way, you can take a test light and hook it to the ground just like you were checking for fire. And you can very gently back probe that boot. Don't pierce the boot, because if you do, something will reach out and get somebody later or cause a misfire. But you, if you can go back in between the wire and the boot far enough to where it'll you know, kill the spark, 
then you can do it that way. But pulling the plug wires off like we used to do, you know, it's not really such a good way to do it, particularly on the newer stuff. Uh, or you can pull cop pull primary leads, or you can pull the uh, injector, you know, and do it like that. Now the long and the short of it was, as the engine warmed up, we found the number one cylinder was dead. We, did, we pinpointed the misfire on cylinder number one. Uh, we connected the O-scope, produced no conclusive results. The pattern was practically the same as all the others. As far as we could tell, it didn't really look like the scope was showing anything, but we had a misfire on cylinder number one. Okay, so what are we going to do next? So it's the it's sparks fine on number one. It's popping, the spark popping on number one, I and you actually are showing a decent scope yeah, pattern on that one. I checked the compression when I was yeah. hot on one. Uh, one of the next step. Well, the one of the things, well, sort of, you're not really so far off, but uh, I would pull the spark plug out and just look at it, because sometimes you'll have a spark plug that will produce a decent pattern, and you know, you know, unless you really, really zoom in on a pattern, you may not see it. You pull a plug out, you know, and if it if it hasn't been firing, and you can, but usually, like I say, if it's if it's a spark plug, you'll see a screwy pattern on your number one. All right, so. A uh, quick look at the spark plug revealed nothing particularly interesting other than the fact that when we measured, it was showing some electrode wear, and we measured the center electrode resistance was higher than the others by about 2,000 ohms, but that in and of itself is not a smoking gun, okay? So it didn't cost much time or cash to throw a, you know, set of spark plug, $2.50 a piece, we slammed a set of plugs in it, didn't do a dead gun thing. All right, so. Listening to the injector with a 7 scope gave no indication that the injector was doing anything wrong. We could hear it going click, 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 but we could do an injector flow test later if we decided to. Now, how many of you guys have done an injector flow test? He said he thought that was old pouring to the motor that he's on. No, that's, uh, <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's, that's that, that guy's right. name is Lewis. He's the one that was working on it for, and that's the car we were working on. All right, so, uh, then anyway, we, uh, so, all right, the engine sounded like it had normal compression on all six cylinders while we were spinning it. Let's see if I can make this happen. Nope, I want to back up. I don't think that's going to work. It should. Nope. Let's see what happened there. <laughs> See? Did you hear any, did you hear anything wrong with that compression? You didn't hear any any cylinders that picked up speed because they weren't squeezing air. That's kind of tricky to be able to build a power point where it's got the sound, you know, that you don't hear it. Alright, let me Yep. A running compression test on the same three cylinders revealed about 100 and, I mean, excuse me, about 75 pounds on cylinder one and 90 on the two behind it. So this is what that engine looked like. Uh, what is the firing order on a uh, straight six? Do you remember? One, four, two, five, three, six. No, one, five, three, six. What is it? One, five, three, six, two, four. That's what it is. I'm sorry. One, five, three, six, two, four. You got that? And um, we hadn't exhausted all the non-intrusive tests. You know, when I'm calling the shots, we're going to pull no rocker arm cover before it's time. Because this is, you know, it's a pain on this one to pull a rocker arm cover. Okay. My guy was running out of ideas. I hadn't scraped the bottom of the barrel yet. I handed him a can of carburetor spray and told him to carefully and sparingly miss the non-flash point prone areas. What is a flash point prone area? That's the exhaust. If you're spraying the exhaust, <clears throat> and the exhaust is hot enough, hot, hotter than the flash point of this stuff you're spraying. It can cause a fire, and whenever a fire happens in the engine compartment, let me tell you what happens when a fire happens in the engine compartment. If you're working in a in a shop, let's say that you do something and you cause the engine compartment to catch fire while you're working on it, and it burns a bunch of wires and stuff. Fire. Nope. You won't get fired. You have to fix it. And if you're working on commission, you got to fix it on your time because you set that car on fire. Now, I will tell you this, I used to set one on fire about once a year. <laughs> I mean, I mean, occasionally you will, you know what I'm saying? It's just, but what you gotta do is you gotta be quick thinking enough to put the fire out with a fire extinguisher that's close by. You better keep an eye on where your fire extinguisher is because you're doing some pretty, you know, the, did you know that a, a cup of gasoline has got as much explosive power as a stick of dynamite? That's, that's something to think about, right? 
Okay, so we were cleaning the injectors on a tempo one time, me and this guy Mark that was helping me, and he was kind of jumpy. And um, so he was over here and he was unhooking the injector cleaning machine and the engine had been running a little warmer than it needed to probably because it's, you know, cooling system may be flushed or whatever. And the exhaust down there in the back was hot enough so that whenever he unhooked the injector McLean, it fell on the exhaust and it caught fire. And there was flames looking up behind the engine right there all of a sudden. Okay, so what would Mark do? Mark went, ooh, 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 this doesn't do any good. Mark, come on, man, get this fire extinguisher. We put it out. We didn't cause any damage or anything, but Mark couldn't, you know. And it's like this guy pulled in one day, Mark, the same guy, this guy pulled in with his Bronco too, and he says, he says, um, he heard a noise under the hood, a little smoke was coming out of the corner of the hood. He goes, over the hood, over the hood. And, the guy, and I was standing there watching that. When he opened the hood, the fire went, ah, ooh, open the hood again. Open. <laughs> I mean, the whole engine compartment was just a mess. Of, and it caught fire while the guy was pulling it in. Now, this girl one time borrowed my dad's 82 Chevrolet pickup truck and drove it down to Florida. And my mom and dad were gone, and she was house-sitting, and her car wasn't running right, so she borrowed my dad's pickup. And she went down to Panama City to get a Mary Kay order or something. Halfway back, something happened under the hood of that truck. It caught fire, and she couldn't do anything about it. It burned all the way down to the rims. You know? Yeah. There was a Tesla over in France that caught fire the other day. The battery caught fire, and it burned. It destroyed that car in five minutes. It surprised me that people got out of it, you know. But I mean. Yeah, one of them Tesla cars. And that was in France. Now, we've had some here that gave trouble too, but yeah. some of it was self driving. Anyway, it changed the way that the engine sounded when he sprayed it up here close to the front around where number one was. Now, what does that mean? It changed the way the engine sounded, it made it run better. He's spraying a little carburetor spray ch -ch -ch like that. Or what is around the front of the intake? Now, he wasn't, when he sprayed around the injector, he didn't notice it very much. But when he sprayed it on the manifold runner and where it would splatter around underneath it, he heard it change. So he you, you got a vacuum leak, so we got to pinpoint that. Huh? All right, so uh, spraying the cleaner down the intake manifold on the driver's side of the intake, he found the skip evaporated and the engine ran smooth. That's Jimmy, he does nothing to do with the story, but here he is. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? Okay, so we're looking at the fuel trim readings, which we had no way to read on this so far. We would, now, what did they call fuel trim before they called it fuel trim? Does anybody know? We've talked about this to some of y'all. Some of y'all should know that. Stoichiometry. Huh? Stoichiometry. No, they call it, no, they didn't call it stoichiometry, please. They called it uh, block learn and integrator. If you ever see those on a scan tool on an older vehicle, GM or whatever, and on some of the uh, French cars or whatever, block learn is long fuel trim, integrator is short fuel trim. Got it? Short fuel trim and long fuel trim was what they were renamed later. I guess because of the Johnny J1930 regulation or something like that. All right, we're looking at fuel trim readings. We would have seen the short numbers dropping back towards zero whenever we sprayed them. See, now what are the fuel trim numbers going to be doing if we were able to see them? Now, I will tell you, block learn and integrator are at 128 when they're in the middle, and they go up and down based on Richard Lean, to, you know, 0 to 255. You know about binary code, right? Electronics, you know, binary code, 8-bit, this kind of thing. 0 to 255 is basically an 8-bit binary code thing. But anyway, that's where they started off on that. But one way or another, what's it going to do? We've got a vacuum leak. Which way is our fuel number, fuel trim number going to go? Hmm? They're going to go up. Why? They're correcting for a lean condition. That's basically what your number is there. All right, so we definitely had some unmetered air making its way into the intake, and while it didn't reveal at the time, I didn't reveal it, uh, I knew there had to be an intake leak right at the point where the injector delivered its fuel. Now, if you've got an intake leak around an injector O-ring or somewhere that's right there where that fuel is being delivered, it will cause that. Now, if you've got an intake leak somewhere else, <clears throat> particularly on this map instead of mass airflow, It'll make the engine run fast a lot of time. All right. One of them would be the injector O-ring, but that one in the area where the spray may need to change. Another would be an intake gasket for all of the number one runner. So I told him to raise it up for a closer look at the underside of the index. It was on that middle lift over there where that black car is right now. We raise this thing up, and we got under there. And incidentally, Whatever works, you know, this guy right here, I found him online. Yeah. He's got a cigar and he's got a hose and he's blowing smoke into the intake. Believe it or not, 
you can put enough cigar smoke into one to actually <laughs> you find it if you do it right. Now, you, that's not really a good way to do it, you know, to tell you the truth, because you are going you need a steady flow of smoke, not puff, 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 you know. But some of us would look for exhaust leaks years ago. If we had an exhaust leak that we actually couldn't tell where it was, we would pour some transmission fluid in the carburetor and then watch the exhaust because the smoke from the burning oil that we poured in there would squirt out the place where the exhaust was leaking. That's why we didn't have a smoke machine. We'd make our own smoke, you know, by doing that. Now you can't smoke test the intake that way, but you can smoke test the exhaust. All right, so this was crowded with a lot of stuff in the lane. Made it hard to see, but it appeared the intake gasket was split right at the bottom of the number one intake runner, which would make perfect sense. See, you can see right here where the intake bolts up against the bottom, a paper gasket is split, and there was air leaking in right there, and there was smoke squirting out there when we put the smoke in there. Now, these paper gaskets, and uh, let me ask you this what does it look like that block's made out of? And what is this made out of? They're both aluminum. They're both aluminum. Now, what do you see? What kind of gaskets do you notice between aluminum and cast iron? When you have aluminum and cast iron with a gasket in between, what's special about those gaskets? What have you noticed? It's, it's coated different on side. Yeah, it's got graphite on it. And graphite's slippery. And as the expansion rates of these two metals are different, it's scrubbing on that graphite instead of wiping it, scrubbing the gasket away. Now, on your uh, F-150s, like the... Uh, well, like the Bronco or the 5.8 out there, it's got the plenum chamber that comes over, and they've got a paper gasket made out of the same material because the intake is aluminum, and so is the, and they just put a paper gasket in there because they feel like, well, those paper gaskets sort of silly because, like you're seeing right here on those F 150s with the uh, 5.0 or the 5.8, that uh, gasket between the upper intake and the lower intake will split and move out of place like that and cause air leaks too. And I don't know how many of those I've changed. It's not really all that difficult to do it once you've done a few of them, but anyway, that's what was going on here. Now, smoke is the best way to find a pinhole leak. Air and hydrocarbons are invisible. Smoke is visible, and we can't submerge the whole system in a half drum of water like we do tires to find an otherwise invisible leak. So, it's like we're magicians. We once had all the inspection mirrors in our toolbox, but now we have smoke and mirrors. Right? That's what, the, that's what magicians use is smoke and mirrors, right? All right. Now, smoke can be used to check for vacuum leaks, EGR leaks at the pedal shaft. Although, I will tell you this, just about any time you smoke an intake, you're going to see the EGR leaking at the pedal shaft. That doesn't mean you need to put an EGR valve on it, so don't even go there. Unless it's an awful lot, you know, that's coming out there. Uh, I mean, a lot of times when somebody's selling a smoke machine, they'll smoke an intake and they'll see a bunch of smoke coming out of an EGR valve, like, ooh, see, we found the smoking gun. Don't mind the plane. All right. Uh, each back air management, control vacuum leaks, wind water leaks, all kinds of stuff you can do with smoke. We know about this. And this smoke that comes out of the smoke machine is not toxic. It's this, really, it's this oil. It's got a kind of a lemon smell to it. It's not bad for your lungs. I mean, I guess if you snorted it up your nose for a while, it might make <laughs> your lungs over a and die or something. But it's not like, you know. And this is what it looked like when we took the intake off. See that little breach right there? Happened all by itself. Uh, so we go move, pull, move, move, move back to line, cap the throttle plane, connect the smoke hose so that it pumps the intake full, and a steady stream of smoke was spewing from this almost unnoticeable split. See, that was hard to see. Even when you got under the car, you had to be looking in just the right place, and to get that picture, I had to hold my camera way up in there and take a picture. <laughs> All right, now this, do you see a leak here? Uh, what is that? That is a grummet where a wire harness is going through the body. I see it. And every time it came a rain and they ran through puddles and everything, the driver's side floor board would get full of water. Now, let me tell you this. If you're working at a dealership, and particularly if you're doing fast service work or new car or used car inspection or whatever, expect to be given squeaks, rattles, water leaks, wind noise. Part of the deal, man. You know, you got to be able to make this happen. And so uh, some of the, some people really enjoy doing squeaks, rattles, water leaks. All that. Remember what I told you? If you got a wind noise, like if your door goes when you're driving, and you don't like hearing it. How do you do it? How do you find it? Huh? Like take a cigarette and Or your smoke machine. That's one way. Or what's another way? I mean, the cigarette by itself is not going to help. Some kind of powder. Yeah, the Dr. Scholes, like yeah. I was talking to you about this morning. You spray that on there, close the door, open it up, see where it didn't wipe the foot powder off. <laughs> that way it's not touching. Another thing, 
if you're going to do what Zane was talking about with the cigarette or with a smoke machine, you can t basically close the doors on the car and put the air conditioning on norm, not recirc, but you only on norm where it's pulling air in from the outside. Turn the blower motor on high. What does that do? Creates positive pressure inside the car. And then you go around the doors with your little, you know, your little smoke machine or whatever, and when you get to the place where the air is leaking out, it'll blow the smoke away, and right there is where you put something behind it to make it tight up. Anyway, down right there was a water leak that we fixed, and I don't remember which car it was on, but I took that picture right here in the shop. So we, we found, and I don't know how that got out of there either, but all we had to do to fix that water leak was work that back up in there. And this is going to be a brief story. My mother-in-law had a Chrysler that they never could fix a water leak on that she bought brand new. And after we got, I got married to my wife, she says, can you look at my water leak? And I said, sure, we'll look at your water leak because she ought to put a towel on the driver's floorboard every time. And so I laid down in the floorboard, you know, took my shoes off so I didn't mess up the seats and laid down in there with a flashlight looking in there while her mother wet the car with a hose. And I saw water coming into the car up there at a body seam. And so I went and got me some body putty and I packed it in there and I was the hero. It didn't take 30 minutes. <laughs> it was easy to do. If somebody's serious about finding a water leak or something, they'll find it. You know what I mean? you got to be serious about it. And you, you don't, you know, if you're not serious about it, you'll walk away and say, oh, you need it. You need somebody else. You know. And if the carpet's wet, you take the carpet out and you hang it on the fence and let it dry and then put it back in. You don't replace the carpet, okay? All right. Now then, let's go back to our test. Now, question one, get your test ready. Get your, get, you got something right with there, John? Dig, John, dig, dig. Technician A says an evaporative leak that is smaller than 10 thousandths of an inch is acceptable according to current federal emission standards. Technician B says the evaporative system is in place to reduce NOx emissions. Who's correct about that? Just write it down. Alright, there you go. Technician A says an evaporative leak is smaller than 10 thousandths of an inch is acceptable according to current federal standards. B says the evaporative system is in place to reduce NOx emissions. Who's correct? Now, technician A and B questions are like two true false questions, basically. Technician A says a perceived lean condition must always be the result of stoichiometric combustion mixture imbalance with too much air and not enough fuel. Too much air and not enough fuel. Oh, okay. That's a sort of complicated wording, isn't it? A perceived lean condition must always be the result of a stoichiometric combustion mixture imbalance. There's too much air and not enough fuel. Technician B says a perceived lean condition can indirectly cause an engine to run rich. So what you mean by perceived lean that is... Perceived lean trims, condition means that... Fuel trims are low? No, if, it, if the oxygen sensor is picking up what it thinks is a lean condition. Is that always going to be too much air and not enough fuel or can there something else be causing it? What about... And I'm going to just go ahead and throw out a spoiler here. What about an air leak just upstream of the oxygen sensor? Well, then, I mean, but it doesn't say, or it does say always. All right, never mind. Yeah. So if you got an air leak upstream of the oxygen sensor, the low pulses in the exhaust can pull oxygen in there. And it doesn't mean that the fuel's out of it. It can make it run rich, too. If it's seeing a lean condition that's not really a lean condition, it'll drive more fuel in there, right? Alright, technician A says, pull in the spark plug wires one at a time to find a weak cylinder and damage the ignition module on some systems. We just talked about that. Technician B says it makes more sense to kill the cylinders one at a time by unplugging the injectors one at a time if possible. Who's correct? Now this is if you can't get a PO3 OX code. And also if you happen to see uh, one bank read really lean, and you know that may, that'll point you to the misfire there. Okay. All right. Question four. The idle air control system on non-electronic automatic throttle control EFI vehicles controls the idle speed by doing what? I don't know. Uh, from non, that'd be just regular throttle bars. Yeah, the, uh, yeah you're, it's not electronic cable, throttle. Cable throttle bars. Yeah, it's a cable throttle bar. Controls the idle speed by doing what? Technician A says an unmetered air leak like a cracked air inlet hose will drive a mass airflow fuel system rich because the mass airflow isn't measuring all the incoming air. Is he right or is he wrong? 
Same issue B says the O2 sensor input can read lean and cause the PCM to drive the entire system rich if one cylinder is misfiring. You got a misfiring cylinder. You've got in that cylinder oxygen that hasn't been burned. Remember, the oxygen sensor does not smell gasoline. It couldn't care less about fuel. All it's smelling is O2. Well, if it's not firing, there's going to be O2 coming out of there that hasn't been processed as well. And that's what it's going to see. That fuel can just go on by. It don't even look at that. It's got its eyes closed to fuel. Technician A says CO emissions can come from two rich air fuel mixtures. Technician B says HC emissions can come from two rich air fuel mixtures. Who's right about that? HC is hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons and CO is carbon monoxide. Remember, every hydrocarbon molecule wants to get married to two oxygen molecules. That's a hint. Hydrocarbon is not monogamous. Okay. Hey, HNA says leaving the oil filler cap loose can cause fuel trim readings to go negative. B says using the wrong PCD valve can cause fuel trim readings to go positive. Not today. What's, what is, what's going on when fuel trim readings are going negative? It means it's running too rich. Yeah. So if you take the oil filler cap off, is it going to read? Is it going to run too rich? So that's all in the crankcase. Yeah, unless there's gasoline in the crankcase, which is you know something it would pick up for the PCB system if that would be the case. That's why if you've got one that's running, it's, it's reading too rich. You want to take your PCB valve out and cap it, and see if stopping that PCB flow does away with some hydrocarbons that are coming out of the crankcase. Technician A says the OBD1 system on some vehicles uses the O2 sensor as a feedback input to determine whether or not EGR is flowing. The technician B says the EGR flow doesn't affect O2 output on OBD2 vehicles. Who's correct about that? If EGR is flowing, does it affect O2? You put some inert gas in there, I'm thinking it might. Okay, You don't see something going on there. Well, question 9, technician A says CO emissions come from two rich air fuel mixtures. Well, HCV says HC emissions come from two rich air. That's another question. I know I've already got it in there twice. I don't care. Answer it the same way you did last time, if you remember. Whoa. All right. This. <laughs> Technician A said older evaporative emission systems purge the canister only at part throttle to prevent rich running idle concerns. You know, the older ones would only purge when the EGR was flowing. They were all tied together. The technician B says some OBD2 evaporative emission systems actually purge the canister while the engine's idling. Now what happens then, John, whenever you gas up, do you pack it in? Do you go click, click, and then shake the truck and try to get a little more in there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's out, and then I yeah. take it if out. You, if you do that on one of the modern vehicles, you can actually cause some, you know, some of them are designed to try to prevent that, but if you uh, make gasoline go down that tube and saturate that canister, and what will happen is you'll be sitting there at, a, at an idle and all of a sudden a PCM says, you know, this might be a good time to do some purging. And so it starts doing some purging and all of a sudden it gets a big gulp of gas out of your canister because you've saturated it from packing the tank. And it goes, oh, <laughs> like that. And the idle speed says, oh no, we almost died. And it opens up. And you're sitting there with your foot barely on the brake and all of a sudden the car goes, boom, and it almost hits the car in front of you. Why? Because you were packing the gas. <laughs> you caused that problem yourself. It's not the car's fault. You know, although I don't understand why they purge it sitting there idling. I never have got that. You know what I mean? Seems like the car ought to have a little eyeball so I can tell if you're sitting in a traffic signal or if there's a car in front of you. You know what I'm saying? Or something like that. Right. That's a difficult test. Isn't it? Is, that, is that a hard test? Yeah. I've known I'm crashing. I mean, people running into cars in front of them because of that. And, you know, they're packing the gas. All right. End of slideshow. All right.